conference are in a listen-only mode. I would now like to turn the call over to our host for today's conference, Mr. Patrick Shepard. Mr. Shepard, you may begin. Should you need assistance throughout your call, please press star zero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Fundamental Series. I'm Patrick Shepard. We hope you enjoyed the National Government Ethics Summit for the month of September. The Fundamental Series was on a break then. We would like to ask those of you who attended any of the sessions on the Ethics Fundamental Series to please remember uh, if you received an evaluation to complete that evaluation. Your feedback is really important to us and if we hope to do similar events in the future, that'll be invaluable. Today we're going to be discussing fundraising and I'm very pleased to be joined by Cheryl Kane Piasecki. Welcome Cheryl. Thanks very much Patrick, I'm happy to be here. Excellent. So we have a lot of folks registered today so I think there's a lot of interest in this topic. And I'd like to remind everyone to please continue to register for these. We realize that you can just go to the YouTube channel at the appointed hour and watch it or the Google Plus page. But your registration really helps us in a number of ways. It helps us keep track of who we're reaching with these events. It helps us solicit your feedback and your feedback is really important to us. We use it all the time when making decisions about what we should be teaching, how we should be teaching it, what kinds of topics that you would be interested in hearing about. It also allows us to keep you updated if there are changes to the regular schedule, if we have new materials, if the links change. All of that uh, is easier for us to manage if you continue to register. So thank you all for registering and uh, please continue to do so. So Cheryl, what are we going to be talking about today? Well, I kind of tis the season for fundraising, Patrick, um, and, and it's the reason that we selected this topic for, for now because um, we have the combined federal campaign, which I'm sure many agencies have already sort of kicked off or in the process of kicking off um, and it, school has started back so folks who have kids um, I think it's it's fundraising is the way that every organization on the planet um, is able to to you know continue to thrive and survive um, and right around the corner we have Thanksgiving and holidays and it's usually around these times when folks want to engage in you know um, collection of foodstuffs for right. like local food banks and and things like that so this is a time of the year when we're really as ethics officials I think pretty much inundated absolutely with these kinds of questions and the and the squirrely thing about this this sort of area is that um, the rules, I mean, surprise, surprise, Patrick, <laughs> the rules that govern um, these types of solicitations and these types of activities are not really neat and tidy. They're not. They're sort of spread across a number of authorities, a number of agencies. And I think this is another area where um, it could be uncomfortable to be an ethics official. Absolutely. Uh, I know my experience with agencies and at an agency, uh, we've had, uh, you know, it's, it's never fun to tell someone that they can't engage in some sort of charitable activity at, in the workplace. It's true. And I think that... Um, the interesting thing too, I think, is that um, when we look at the various authorities that are out there, and you mentioned this, that we're looking at different agencies, we're looking yes. at different authorities, um, but in addition, I think that um, we have to be um, aware that fundraising is something that we don't want to necessarily discourage, right. but I think we have to talk a little bit about, before we get into like our GPS out so that we can navigate through all the regulations, I think the, one of the first things I always like to do is say, take sort of a 64,000 foot view of these things, which is to say, you know, you know, on the face of it, fundraising, yeah, it's a noble and great thing for people to engage in and you don't want to dissuade people from doing it, but there, it doesn't come without some harm. Right, and I think that's, that's the hardest question to answer and probably the most important one is, you know, where is the harm? What is the harm in engaging in fundraising activities in the workplace? Uh, you know, who, who suffers and how can that adversely affect the, uh, the missions and efficiencies of our programs and operations? And I think what you're going to see today as we're walking through some of the various authorities is that you do have tremendous flexibilities in your workplace. Your agency had and your agency has flexibilities about establishing your own policy, policies and procedures for what you're going to allow your employees to do and the types of activities, solicitations and otherwise, that you're going to allow them to conduct in your own workspace. So I think it's important for you to be armed with um, sort of a defense of whatever position you want to uh, hold or, or establish with respect to any harms that you think th that need to be taken into consideration before just immediately approving any and all yeah. fundraising activities. No, and I, I think that's really important to be able to explain why these things are problematic because the reaction that you're likely to receive from employees who are engaged in these kinds of activities um, is maybe not outrage but disappointment. 
And yes. you know, any time that we're going to be disappointing employees, uh, we, we should not be doing that unnecessarily. We should have a good reason. Exactly. And I think it, what comes to mind for me are a couple of big issues. Number one, I think, is the whole notion of, you know, the the, the federal workforce is a, is a pretty big captive audience. And there are a lot of folks out there. I mean, everybody's out there struggling for, for resources and funds. And so I can think there are any number of organizations who would love to be able to get access to that captive audience and be able to rely on a federal workforce um, to be able to to, to um, solicit funds for their particular benefits. So we have the issue of um, of not showing favoritism, of right. not giving un, undue sort of like uh, access to certain groups over other groups. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I think that's what CFC was designed for. CFC was designed to acknowledge the the the, 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 need, the, the need, need and the and desire exactly. of federal employees to contribute to uh, to noble causes, but to level the playing field between those causes, so that one group or one cause doesn't have a monopoly on that solicitation. Exactly, and to do it in a way that's non-coercive, so that employees are at liberty to, if they choose to contribute, but not necessarily feel forced to, right. or particularly not feel like they're, you know, like maybe certain people in the agency have a pet project, and then you feel sort of coerced by your 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 peers or your coworkers. There was that problem, the expectation exactly. of contribution. Uh, you know, that's something that came up in the Hatch Act presentation at the National Government Ethics Summit. You know, this idea of coercion by managers or supervisors to contribute to certain causes. Exactly. So I think that's one harm that we want to be we want to be mindful of, and I think it's a legitimate argument for you to bring to the table if you have concerns about fundraising that's go that's sort of outside of the, the combined federal campaign. But I think it's the disruption in the workplace, too. Also that, yes. So, so we're at work to work, and presumably we're serving the public's interest and we're carrying out our agency submissions, uh, as, as, as noble as it might be to be engaged in charitable activities for other outside organizations. That's not why we're being paid by the taxpayers. Exactly. And and the very fact that we want to keep the workplace as much, you know, involved in doing the work of, of the American public, but also, I think, um, so that people don't feel like they're constantly being hit up by their coworkers to right. support this, that, or the, or the other cause. Yeah. Um, so, so with that in mind, um, I think now we are going to turn to, um, we're going to turn to the subject at hand, which is is fundraising we're going to talk about today. Um, in addition to the slide deck, um, I've given you a copy of a document that I created actually several years ago and it was in the wake, um, we had done an, an, an Ethical Implications of Emergency Response Conference um, in the wake of Katrina and Rita and one of the things that came out of that conference was uh, folks said that they felt like they were, it was, they were woefully inadequate resources to help them navigate through the minefield of fundraising. Right. And, of and course, that was a very challenging time exactly. because there there were you know, time constraints, people were having to act and decide now, 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 and being unprepared to make those decisions was, you know, actual real harm could be caused. Exactly. So what we did with this document, I pulled this document together, but um, I did it with, um, with the assistance of the Office of Personnel Management and with the review of the General Services Administration. But this document, I mean, I'm going to be dipping into it periodically throughout the rest of the hour. Um, I'd like you to have it in, in front of you on your screen or, or in a hard copy if you can. This document is basically a navigational tool. It is designed to help you uh, break down each of the authorities to, um, to establish the discrete definitions that you're going to have to understand to know what authorities are going to apply depending upon what the nature of the solicitation is, depending upon where the solicitation is taking place, depending upon who is being solicited, and depending upon who's going to be the beneficiary of that solicitation. And that's what this document does, is sort of leads you through each of those authorities and that's how it's structured. And I think that's one of the hardest parts about these kinds of ethics issues that we face is knowing where to start. You exactly. know, where do we begin? What information do we need? What definitions are important? What authorities might we consider uh, that is the difficult part you know the, the discrete decisions aren't necessarily tremendously complicated you just have to remember to make them exactly and and that's why this document does not purport to be an interpretive document it is not taking fact situations and applying those authorities to them this document is telling you if you have something in front of you that looks like this then these are the authorities that you have to consult and so sort of a caveat or, or, or a, 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 um, I want to I want to make sure it's abundantly clear a condition I want to make sure that's abundantly clear to everybody with respect to this presentation and this document is that OGE 
CTE is not purporting to interpret the combined federal campaign regulations or the federal management uh, regulations, although I am going to make reference to both of those today, and we're going to talk a little bit about those and juxtapose those with OGE's authorities. But OGE does not have the authority to interpret those, those uh, rules. We don't attempt to do that in the document. We're not going to attempt to do that today in the process of our... And I think this is also an area where uh, case studies and examples aren't tremendously instructive because right. um, there can be proposed kinds of activities that on their face look very, very similar. Right. Um, and small details can make an enormous difference into in the outcome of the advice that you're going to provide. Uh, so this is an area where we probably want to avoid saying, well, this is like that thing that happened before, so it must be okay or not okay. Exactly. Exactly. Um, okay, so if you would be able to bring up the first slide for us, Patrick. I can bring up the slides. Sure. Just a moment. What we're going to be doing um, for the rest of the, the hour is we're going to be sort of marching ourselves through um, various and sundry of the regs and try to make sense of how these regs um, interact with one another. So if you could bring up the first slide for me, Patrick, that would be great. Sure, I'd be happy to. Just a second, please. Okay, um, we're going to start with OGE's regulations on fundraising, um, and the reason I want to do that is because OGE in that regulation expressly addresses um, the combined federal campaign regulations at 5 CFR Part 950. And so for us to understand how OGE's regs differ from the CFC regs, we have to sort of look first to the CFC reg. So if you look on this first slide, in the very first paragraph in the fundraising provisions of the standards of conduct, we basi it basically says, an employee may engage in fundraising only in accordance with the restrictions in Part 950 of this title. Um, um, on the conduct of charitable fundraising in the federal workplace. Okay, so we want to start with the CFC rules to say, okay, where does the CFC, where does 950 stake out its claim? Because once we know where CFC stakes out its claim, then we're going to know, you know, where we have to draw the line if for whatever reason we have a situation that doesn't meet the stipulations of Part 950. So if you can bring them the next slide for me, Patrick. Sure. Okay, so now we're in 950, and if we look at uh, 950.102A, which is, is, it lays out the scope of the Combined Federal Campaign Authority. <coughs> that very first sentence is a wee sentence, but it's a packed sentence, and we're going to unpack it in a minute, but that's where the description of 950 really is. It's the CFC is the only authorized solicitation of employees in the federal workplace on behalf of charitable organizations. Okay, that's a packed sentence. It consists of four parts that are going to have to be met in order, and when those conditions are met, you know you're dealing with a CFC authority, which is to say that that would be a situation where only CFC um, authorizes that kind of solicitation. So if you look at here, it's saying it's a solicitation, that's the first piece, and we're going to look at what solicitation means in a minute, of employees, federal employees, so it has to be two feds, in the federal workplace, we're going to look at what does that mean, but it's going to have to take place in the federal workplace on behalf of charitable organizations. Okay? So those are our four pieces. Can I have the next slide, please? Sure. So the first piece, which is solicitation, is also found, it's defined in 950. And this is a critical piece because this is really what distinguishes fundraising as that def as we're going to start as we're going to continue to use that definition from other types of solicitations and collections okay so fundraising is going to have a very it's going to be discussing a very limited kind of solicitation so when we use fundraising in this document and when we use fundraising in this presentation from now on it's going to basically refer to this which is solicitation means any action requesting money either by cash check or payroll deduction on behalf of charitable organizations. So would it be fair when we see fundraising <laughs> throughout the presentation when we're thinking about these kinds of concepts to sort of substitute that fundraising is what happens when you make a solicitation under this definition? Yes and no. I mean, there's a distinction between fundraising. There is going to be a distinction between fundraising as 950 defines it and fundraising as OGE defines it. Okay. And we're going to get there in a second. But what I want you to understand is this is talking about requesting money. 
this is not talking about requesting items in kind. So if you have an items in kind solicitation for food, for toys, for clothing, for books, for any sort of tangible item, that is by definition not going to be fundraising for purposes of the CFC. And when we get there, you're going to see as well, that's also not going to be fundraising for purposes of OGE's fundraising regulations. And I think that's an area where people have, have a lot of difficulty, you know, in, in distinguishing between those two uh, kinds of activities. This is an example of one of those times where things can look very similar but have important distinctions. Uh, the difference between an in-kind solicitation versus a solicitation for money makes a big difference to us, right? Absolutely. It's critical. I mean, it's really kind of the only way you're going to be able to get your head around when you have to worry about the CFC, when you have to worry about 2635-808 and OGE's rules, and when you have to look to other authorities to see whether or not there are any restrictions on the activity. So once you can get your head around this kind of concept that fundraising isn't as expansive as you think it is, that when you talk about fundraising for purposes of these rules, you are talking primarily about requesting money or monetary support. Okay, that's okay. very helpful. Okay, so if we could go to the next slide. What I've done here then is to just break this out for you and, and to say that, again, when we're talking about fundraising for, part, for purposes of 950, if somebody comes to you with a request to do a solicitation that's going to involve requesting money, they want to do it in the workplace, they want to do it soliciting federal employees and it's going to benefit a charitable organization, then the, the, they can't do that outside of the CFC. The CFC will be the only authority that allows for that in the federal workplace, the solicitation of federal employees. That sounds like a sort of a nice tidy bright line that uh, we, can, we can rely upon and sort of uh, place our flag. It is and it's not because as we all know the devil's in the definitions and the definitions, to the extent the definitions were bright line, that would be handy. But in a minute, I'm going to explain to you how it's not quite as handy as we'd like it to be, maybe. Well, it's never uh, simple. Is it, it is <laughs> never simple. So, so, so now that we've established kind of the parameters for 950, let's move back to OGE's regulation so we can talk a little bit about how fundraising, the definition of fundraising differs a little bit for purposes of OGE's regulation. So for the next, for, the, for 808, this is where OGE's um, uh, fundraising regulations um, reside. Our definition of fundraising, it, it, it's got parts of it that are similar to the, CF, to the CFC's definition or 950's definition, which is we say that fundraising means the raising of funds for a nonprofit organization. So that's parallel with CFC because CFC is raising of funds for a charitable organization. Um, and with respect to the 950, there are places in 950, I think, which further define what they mean by charitable organization. From what I could see, for the most part, it looks like they're talking about 501c3s. And I think for OGE's purposes and our definition, we're pretty much looking at the same thing, 501c3 organizations by large and in the main. Um, but anyway, so that's where the parallels are between OGEs and, and CFC. And we expand upon that a little bit further, and this is where we start having a little bit of disjunction between OGE's definition and, C and the 950 definition. If we go down to paragraph little, one little I and two little I, the first one is um, uh, fundraising or the raising of funds can be done either through the solicitation of funds or the sale of items, and that's really not different from because it's a request for money. It's a request for money. It's a request for money. But here we have something that slightly differs from CFC, and that's that participation in the conduct of an event where any portion of the cost of attendance or participation may be taken as a charitable tax deduction by a person incurring that cost. So, so that's a little bit different. That is a little bit different because although there may be a request for money, it's an indirect request. And the way that you're deemed to be engaging in that raising of funds is by participating in an event where those donations are being requested. Uh, so in some ways, this is a, a little bit broader than the Part 950 definition. Absolutely. It is definitely, definitely broader than the 950 definition. So we have a, a slight broadening of the notion of, of how, through what mechanism, you can raise funds, which distinguishes 808. But in addition, 808 doesn't care whether it's federal employees or non-federal employees. So the restrictions in 808, the fundraising provisions in 808, are going to reach to solicitations of non-federal employees, you know? CFC right. is only concerned about targeting federal employees. 808 says feds, non-feds, you know, it's, it's, it can, it, it can it be does, anybody. It doesn't matter, yes. And the one other place where there's a distinction is whereas with CFC, the solicitation has to take place in the federal workplace, 
for purposes of 808, it contemplates that it can take place outside of the federal workplace. In fact, in my experience, it very often, uh, you know, if I'm looking at something under 808, the proposal is to do it outside of the federal workplace. Exactly, exactly. So, th so this is just, again, to sort of drive home the meaningful distinctions between these two definitions so that you know when you should be looking at 808 and when 950 is going to trump 808. Um, now, the, the wrinkle that we talked about in definitions, this is where the wrinkle comes in. And here's where I want to refer you to the document that I gave you, the document that talks about the fundraising in the workplace, the 10-page document or 8-page document I gave you. And if you'll look at um, page 1 of that document, not one little lie, but page 1, numeral 1. Here's where we supply definitions for purposes of our document. And we, we do a lot of what I just did, which is what is fundraising for purposes of 950, what is fundraising for purposes of 808. And if you look down at the bottom of, the, of there, we provide a definition for what constitutes in the workplace. This one is, is always tricky. Uh, I, I don't know any ethics officials who are really happy about having to make these distinctions. And this, one's, this one is just, it is what it is, folks. Um, the Office of Personnel Management, and this was a piece that I did definitely consult with OPM on, um, it's sort of implied in one part of 950, and when we get there I'll point out to you where this, this definition is kind of implied, um, but I was told that um, OPM has informally interpreted in the workplace to mean those spaces within the federal space where work is actually being conducted. And they went on to say that subject to the discretion of the head of the agency or each or department, the workplace for purposes of CFC solicitations does not necessarily have to include spaces like lobbies, cafeterias, kitchens, or any other sort of public area or area that's not used primarily or exclusively for conducting work. For the conducting of business. So that uh there was an opportunity to draw a bright line and just say on federal property, but that's not what's happened. So if we have areas, and I think this makes sense in a lot of cases, it might not make sense for every agency in every area, like here at OGE, we're a very small space, and making these distinctions would be, I don't know, complicated because mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a lot of uh, recreational or social space in, in, our, in our, our, our office environment. But I could imagine if you're an agency with a large campus that you have recreational facilities or, you know, family facilities, um, those kinds of things. It, it kind of does make sense that agencies are empowered to make that kind of distinction. Exactly. So if you can give me the next, let me see, the next slide or maybe the slide after that. So, yeah, that slide right there. So, so while CFC is basically saying, you know, when we talk about solicitations in the workplace, e.g., that's when 950 is the exclusive authority, CFC reigns supreme, they seem to be just saying we're suggesting that's in the spaces where work is conducted. So what that means then for purposes of 808 and for other, for other purposes we're going to talk about in a minute, but that for purposes of 808, solicitations that are, that are done not in the federal workplace could, subject to your agency or your department's own policies or procedures, could reach to places like your kitchens or to your cafeterias or to your lobbies or to some of these other spaces that OPM has said we give flexibility to the agencies to use those spaces in manners um, that they see fit. But if they decide to do so, they still have to do that in accordance with the provisions at uh, 2635-808. Yes, exactly. So what I'm saying is that if you are going to allow people to do fundraising in those spaces, as it's defined in 808, they are still going to be subject to the restrictions in 808. And that was a beautiful segue, if you could bring up the next slide for me. So what we've done with 808 up to this point is just define what constitutes fundraising, like what is the type of activity that our regulation regulates. So what, what, what 808 says is people can uh, fundraise. They fundraise in a, in a personal capacity. It's not an absolute prohibition on fundraising. But what it does say is if you are going to engage in personal fundraising, there are some restrictions on from whom you can solicit those funds. Okay, that makes sense. And so it's a two-part restriction effectively, and it says you can't solicit funds from subordinate employees. Even if it's in the kitchen, even, even if, if it's in the gym. Yeah, it, you know, you cannot, yeah. you cannot solicit funds from subordinate employees. Okay. And you may not solicit funds 
from people who are known to be prohibited sources, as that is defined in the gifts from outside sources provision in, in 203D. And I, th I think that makes a lot of sense. We wouldn't want a situation where agencies are rounding up all of the contractors and uh, you know, asking them for donations. That, uh, you know, as we talked about before, would be inconsistent with our goal of avoiding coercive environments when we're talking about fundraising in or outside of the workplace. Exactly, and the coercion piece is also present in that first restriction because we don't want subordinate employees to feel coerced by superiors into supporting a, a, a charitable you know, cause um, that, they, that they might have. And I think this is something that's important for us to be able to articulate mm -hmm. uh, when we're advising employees about these things. Because you know, when you have to say no to someone's uh, apparent noble fundraising exercises it's important to say you know the concern that we have is this and it's not that we think you're a bad person or that you're you're trying to coerce anyone but we have these rules in place to make sure that that doesn't happen exactly exactly um, if you could give me the next slide please so what 808 is saying is you can you can generally speaking um, you can generally speaking uh, fundraise in a personal capacity you can't solicit subordinates you can't solicit prohibited sources and we have a definition of what constitutes personally solicit and personally solicit means I think conventionally what anybody kind of no-brainer would expect it to mean which is you know when you are directly asking someone for a donation or some other monetary support for a cause that clearly is personally soliciting but we go a little further than that and we say that it can also extend to instances where you are lending your name for somebody else to use or you yourself are using your name in correspondence or in some more in, some kind of indirect solicitation of uh, of subordinates or or prohibited sources um, now I haven't given you the full definition there if you look in your regulation there's a the definition goes on because that sort of like defines what it means but then it goes on to explain itself a little further to say that when we're talking about use of correspondence, when we're talking like like a blast email or a, a blast mailing or something that's going to go out to uh, an enormous number of people, um, you're not going to be deemed to have personally solicited um, if there happen to be prohibited sources among those who got who received your email or your or your mailing blast or subordinates, provided that provided that. Um, they were not targeted and you were not aware that they that there was like a, a, a significant group or whatever of prohibited sources or subordinates who were among those who would receive so if, if you were participating in a solicitation maybe in your neighborhood uh, mm -hmm. on behalf of some cause and one of your subordinates or a prohibited source happened to be amongst the people living in your neighborhood who received the flyer or what have you uh, that would be the kind of situation where that that doesn't necessarily constitute exactly and I think I think it's a matter of you know we we wrote it in a way to make sure that people understood we weren't going to try to um, imply that simply by virtue of sending out something that you are you are always in control of who's on the receiving end of it or that you always have perfect knowledge of who's going to be on the receiving end of it. And we'd have sort of a weird situation where we'd have to audit uh, entire mailing lists to make sure that no person on this list also works for any of these companies. Exactly. And that, that could be you know, that's just not feasible. Exactly. Um, but, but by the same token, we don't want somebody to try to too be too clever by half and use this as a mechanism to sort of blind, but, you know, sort of pretend that it's a mass emailing or use a mass emailing as a way to masquerade something that was clearly very targeted. Yeah, so if we were trying to target, say, a prohibited source and we decided to add a, f a few other groups of people or, uh, you know, someone else's right. email list, you know, that's not, the, that's not the intent of the rule. The rule is in place so that if inadvertently we do this, we don't have a big problem, not to create a loophole so that we can uh, subvert the purpose of the rule. Precisely, precisely. Now, while you may lend your name to correspondents, um, if you can pull up the next slide for me, Patrick. The other restriction in 808 about your personal fundraising is that you may not, and this, and for most of us, I think this is kind of, again, kind of a duh, kind of a no-brainer. Um, you can't use or permit the use of your official title, authority, or any, you know, authority associated with your position in connection with the fundraising activity. So, yeah, you can use your name but you can't use your title, you can't use where you work, you can't use the name of your agency, you can't do any of those kinds of things in support of the fundraising activity. And that's consistent with principles we see implemented elsewhere in the standards of conduct. There's mm -hmm. a notion that you know you should not use your pu public office for the private gain of anyone else, uh, you know, regardless of if they're a nonprofit organization. Well, and the interesting thing here is we actually got a little pushback and a little flack from some of some um, some entities when these regs first came out, suggesting that there are some public officials 
who have such name recognition that having their name attached, you know, while they're serving in certain positions, having their name attached to a fundraising and their name alone would be tantamount to using their official title or position because they have such name recognition. This is indistinguishable, their personal and their private, or their professional and private selves. Exactly. And that was exactly what we pushed back with. And we said, we don't think that those individuals should be deprived of an ability to have a private identity. Um, right. and, should, and should invariably be associated with their public office simply because they happen to hold a fairly high-profile position in government and somebody might recognize their name immediately and associate it with that position. Yeah, and I think you know, that's consistent if you consider some of the other areas in the standards where we have restrictions on use of official title. If you said that someone's private self was indistinguishable from their official title, mm -hmm. those restrictions would become so onerous uh, that they really couldn't have a private life. Exactly. And I, I think many of them complain that they don't have enough of a private life yes. as it is anyway. So, um. But then on the other side, there are lots of people who said they shouldn't anyway. They should always be working. <laughs> okay, so if you could pull up the next slide. Um, while I said we're not really going to interpret here, I did want to throw up a few examples just because I think helping to solidify these definitions by way of some examples I think just helps, you know, get, keep people, you know, gives them a context in which to understand everything we were just talking about. Um, so for the first one, for example, Patrick, selling candy bars for your child's daycare center, presuming that the, a daycare, that this daycare center is a nonprofit, nonprofit. or a charitable organization. Right. Do you think this is something that could bump up against the 950 provisions? That's interesting. That's a, that's a good question, because 950 is pretty clear that it has to be a solicitation of money. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems that that's what we're doing here. You just yes. happen to get a, a candy bar in exchange for your solicitation, you know, much like if you're invited to a dinner or something, you get the dinner after you make the donations. Right. I, I'd be inclined to say that maybe we, we would be concerned about 950 here. Yes, I think we should be concerned about 950 here because, again, what the request is, the request is for money, the hap the, 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 that you're giving somebody some tangible thing in exchange for it does not, you know, take away the fact that you are, do you are engaging in an action, and that's what the solicitation is, an action that requests money, and the sale of an item is an action where you are requesting money. Um, so the key here would be, if you were doing this, if you put the candy bars on your desk in your office with a little sign. Okay. So now, remember, we got to meet all these things. So we think it's a solicitation. Right. It's a, it's a, yes. But it has to be personal in, in the workplace. Well, if we're looking at 950. First. Right. So okay. it's got to be it's got to be a solicitation. It has to be soliciting federal employees. So if it's on your desk in your office, you're soliciting employees. Yes, yeah. It has to be in the federal workspace. Okay. I think so. we... I normally work at you my desk. desk. <laughs> <laughs> if that's a social space, then you've got bigger problems than fundraising. Okay, so so it's it's at your desk, so you're soliciting employees, you're soliciting them in the federal workspace, and it's benefiting? A charity. A charity. So this, I think, falls squarely in I, I, I think it does. So, so outside of the CFC? You wouldn't be able to do that right. in the workplace. Now, how about 808? What would we be concerned about with respect to OGE's fundraising um, issues here? Because it is a solicit it's a sa sale of items, right? Right. For a nonprofit organization. Yes. So, what restrictions would the employee have with respect to this? Well, we'd be concerned about uh, primarily solicitation from subordinates. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, but also prohibited sources if they happen to be in the office space. Right. Uh, so, we would have some concerns there. Okay. Now, remember, we can't do it in the office space because if we do it in right, the office we, we space, we have problems with 950. We have the problems with 950. So, if we're talking about 808, we're talking about doing this in other than federal workspace. So if we are going to do this in the gymnasium or... In the gymnasium or out completely outside, outside of, of the, the workplace, um, that's the thing to remember. Those restrictions, those personal solicitation restrictions are going to follow you even if your solicitation is outside of the workplace. So don't think that just because you're outside of the workplace, you can suddenly start hitting on subordinates to support a personal fundraising effort. Because that, that's the, not the case. The, the federal workplace is immaterial because federal workplace relates more to the CFC provision. So these are really two separate analyses, and we'd be right. well served uh, to look at 950 first. Yes. Because that's fairly dispositive about solicitations and fundraising in the workplace. Yes. And then if we find that 950 it isn't prohibitive. Then we look at 808 because we could also have problems there in addition. Exactly. And exactly. I think that's where these things are so hard is you look at something and you, you think you've resolved all of the issues under one authority 
And you turn around and you find out, well, there's another authority which actually makes this impossible. Exactly. And that's why these things are so troubling and they are so complicated. So the next one is a fairly straightforward one. Soliciting support for your 10K run for some sort of charitable organization. So again, we're soliciting. We're, we're definitely asking for money here. We're asking for money for a nonprofit organization, for charitable organization. organization. Okay. So then the, what are the critical factors here we would have to look at? So, so we'd be looking at whether or not this is taking place in the workplace first off for, right. for our 950 analysis. Uh-huh. And there might be a way to get around that, right? We could do it in a common space or outside of the, or, or outside of the workplace altogether. Yeah, and, and, the, and the way that we see this happen most often, that it doesn't conflict with the CFC um, or doesn't bump up against 950, is when somebody simply posts, like if they're looking to get people to sponsor them, they'll just post it on a, on a, a bulletin board that's been approved by the agency for purposes of personal um, you know, right. personal notifica- notices and things like that. And typically those bulletin boards are going to be in locations that arguably are or could be designated as exactly. not the workplace. And that, that obviates a lot of concerns because no one's forced to go look at the, at the bulletin board. You know, there's not... Uh, it, it takes away some of that coercive concern that we, we mentioned before. Exactly. So, uh, you know, so as long as it's not taking place in the workplace, then you're, you're, what you're looking at are the 808 provisions. And you would, there, it would simply be a matter of um, making sure that the space in which you were providing, so the bulletin board was approved for that purpose, that the space itself was approved to be a not, not a workplace space for purposes of CFC. Right. And then I agree with you, Patrick. I think the mere posting of that in... Uh, a common area, um, like a kitchen or someplace that had been approved for these postings, would not be sufficient to say that you were targeting subordinates or you were targeting prohibited sources. Right, because li- literally anyone could walk into the kitchen and, and see that, and also no one's required to see it. Uh, you know, if you're like me, I'm fairly oblivious when I go into the kitchen at work. I mm-hmm. want to get my sandwich and I want to get out of there, and I rarely stop to look at anything hung on the bulletin board. Exactly. So I think there are ways that the that this would fall within 808 and be acceptable under 808. Um, and then last one I have here, soliciting donations to be given to a charity in lieu of a gift to a departing employee. Hmm. This is tricky and this comes up. This yeah. is an actual question that does come up, I know. Yeah, and this does. doesn't sound like a fun one to deal with one way or the other. No, no, <laughs> it isn't. Um, so we have to look at it from the, from the 950 standpoint. If you're soliciting donations for a charitable organization, you've met two of the prongs. Right soliciting if you do it in the workplace and you're and if you're doing it for a departing employee well chances are you're targeting other federal employees to contribute to this so doing it in the federal workspace this would be this would bump up against CFC and CFC would sort of trump this and basically say you can't do this in the federal workspace targeting federal employees so we we sort of don't even have to get to 808 here we've I think 808 would be really, really hard to try to, because, yeah. because and then the other thing too is I don't want people thinking that we're, we're trying to say that 808 is some kind of workaround to CFC. Mm. I'm not, that is not the message here. The message is not look to 808 to get around CFC. It's the, they're, they're layered. Yes. Uh, so that in some ways 808, uh, well 808 definitely regulates behaviors that aren't contemplated or discussed at all under, uh, under Part 950. Right. Uh, and we have to consider those things as well. It's actually an, an extra st- set of st- restrictions. So when I look at these, I like to look at 5 CFR Part 950 first. Right. And then if uh, if it's not prohibited there, then look to 808 and see if, if further restrictions would apply. Exactly. But I think with this last example, I just don't think there's any way. You, the, the 950 wouldn't allow it, and I don't think there's any way 808 could permit it either because, really, you would be soliciting in, in federal workspace. Um so, uh, so if you can get to the to, to take this down to the next um, slide, these are some other examples of fundraising that I wanted to cover because I want to pull us back into that second provision in 808 that deals not just with soliciting funds, but that also talks about participation in the conduct of an event. Because I think that gives a lot of agencies a lot of heartburn. So I wanted to c- have a couple of, of examples here to sort of pull us back. Yeah, because I, I think these are kind of unclear. It's it's difficult to make the distinctions and to really understand what this concept means. Exactly. So our first example is um, if someone is to be seated at the head table at a charitable fundraising event. Okay. Um, can you pull up the next slide for me? And we'll come back to the to this one after we're done with, with the first question. Um, this is going to reach us to the participation in the conduct of an event. Um, and when you look at the definition of that, it basically says it means active and visible participation in the promotion, production, or presentation of an event and includes serving 
As an honorary chairperson sitting at a head table during the event and standing in a reception line, okay? So what this is effectively saying is you will be considered to be personally fundraising if you attend an event, a yes. charitable event, where part of the cost of attendance is being taken as a charitable contract tax deduction and a donation to a charitable organization, and where you are assuming a role that is visible and that gives would give someone the impression that you are promoting that event or more involved in that event than simply merely attending that event. And I think that's that's important. I like to think of this uh, this provision as delineating what it means to be other than a mere attendee. Mm -hmm. uh, we say uh, it doesn't prohibit mere attendance, and then we even caveat that. Right. Right. We say you know as long as you're not being used as. Uh, you know, your name is not being used or your person is not being used to help promote the event. Mm -hmm. So basically, you can merely attend, and if you're doing anything in addition to that, uh, you very likely are, are participating, uh, you're very likely participating in the conduct of the event. So if you are going to this event in your personal capacity and you're going to be sit seating at, sit sitting at the head table, then you will be deemed to be participating in fundraising. And so those restrictions that we talked about earlier, those personal solicitation restrictions, are going to apply to your participation in that event, okay? But we have this other thing that comes up for a lot of folks, and this is really where I think people get confused and it, it causes consternation. And that's this notion of what if you have one of your officials who's been invited to speak at a fundraising event? And what have we traditionally said? Have we said, no, you can't send somebody to speak in an official capacity at a fundraising event? I don't know. That's, that's, a, that's a good question. And this, mm -hmm. you mean, you mean if officially? Mm -hmm. uh, do you, does mm -hmm. OGE constrain uh, agencies in their, their prerogative to send uh, their, their people to speak officially? Um, I don't think we have. I, th no. I think there are conditions under which we've found that that, that, is, that is appropriate. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, outside of the scope of you know, the, the employee's conduct, it's uh, really a question of agency prerogative in some ways. Mm -hmm. And if you go to the next slide. Okay. Actually, when we talk about, because we, we exclude that from the, the definition of participation in an event. We say participation in the conduct of an event does not include providing an official speech. So then we go on to define, okay, well, what does that mean? What, what do you have to do with, that constitutes giving of an official speech such that it doesn't also make you participating in the conduct of the event? And here we say uh, speech is given by the employee in his official capacity on a subject matter that relates to his official duties, provided that the agency is determined, and this is one of the things that we sort of put back on you, that you have to determine that this is an appropriate venue for the dissemination of this information. And sometimes it is. I mean, sometimes the nature of the for fundraising sure. is it's completely appropriate and a completely appropriate venue for the delivery of, of it, the it content. It may be the, uh, the appropriate audience that you'd like to reach. Uh, it may be one of the few ways that you can reach all of those people at once. Exactly. So, so that's why I mean, OG really defers to agencies and gives you full authority to making determinations about when and under what circumstance. Just because it's a fundraising activity, it does not mean that it's not appropriate for the provision of a, an official speech. But one of the things that we do say that has to that your speaker has to be really careful about is to make sure um, that the um, that they do not request donations or other support for the nonprofit organization. So their speech has to really stick to content. It really has to stick to subject matter that's related to the agency's purpose for being there and steer completely away from supporting, donating, you know, looking to be somehow providing some, some sort of support to the fundraising activity. And that seems very sensible to me because uh, OGE, you know, we don't want to constrain the prerogative of agencies to assign their people to speak to whoever they feel they need to speak to. Mm -hmm. But we also want to be very careful about the apparent use of government authority for the private gain of outside individuals. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and I'm going to come back to that in a second, but I want to sort of finish out the thought here. So remember our question was whether or not you could be seated at the head table. And remember that we said typically if you're just going to be there in your personal capacity, if you're seated at the head table, that con constitutes participation in the conduct of the event. So pull me up to the prior slide one minute, Patrick. So the, the definition of participate in the conduct of the event sort of carves out this, well, if you're speaking in your official capacity, that's not participation in the conduct of the event. But it goes on to say as well um, that while the term generally includes any public speaking during the event, okay, it says it does not include the delivery of an official speech um, 
or any seating or other participation appropriate to the delivery of such a speech. So, so once that makes sense to me. So if, yes. if, if you've been assigned to speak at an event and there's a, a speaker table maybe on the stage at the right. event, and all of the speakers are sat in a row, probably the order in which they're going to speak. Right. Um, this provision 808 doesn't say that I have to go sit in the back until it's my turn to come talk and then I have to go back there. Exactly, exactly. What, what this provision is saying is that when you're giving an official speech, you know, where they seat you, you know, to, that's appropriate for the fact that you're going to be a keynote speaker or the keynote speaker or be delivering a speech is not going to suddenly transform your participation from strictly an official duty participation to participation in the conduct of a fundraising event. Now, the only thing I would say about that is be really careful about that. I don't know that it would necessarily be appropriate or necessary for the person to stand in, for example, a receiving line in order to be able to have given the official speech. So I don't think it means that all bets are off about, you know, what no, you do at the, the event. The, I don't think the goal here is to relieve agencies of their obligation to consider these kinds of appearances and risk the reputation and the concern that it appears that the agency is sanctioning the fundraising activity. We still have to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just outside of the scope of 808, which you know, applies to, to, to persons as individuals. Exactly. And, and a point that you had raised earlier about not wanting to allow organizations to sort of use public office for private gain sort of thing or allow employees to do that. Um, w one thing I always advise agencies is that if your person is going to be giving an official speech and they are the keynote speaker at the event, if you have any concerns about the way that that speech is going to be represented or the extent to which that speech is going to be used as a draw for the fundraising effort, um, you're completely within your rights to negotiate that with the organization when you agree to have your person speak and say, we want to see any correspondence, we want to see any invitations, and we want to have approval on any sort of thing that's going out that's advertising or promoting this, this, um, this, this activity because we cannot allow you to use our person as a fundraising draw for your, for your function. Yeah, and a lot of organizations, in my experience, have many v avenues through which they disseminate this kind of information. So I think it's important to be clear to explain to them what the restriction is and that it doesn't apply just to the invitation, uh, but to, you know, the, the totality of the materials they'll be, they'll be sending out. Exactly, exactly. Okay, well, let's keep moving down here because um, if we could uh, just take me down a couple of slides, Patrick. All right. So we covered official speech. Okay, oop, back oh, one, up one. Missed it. There we okay. go. Okay. So, we, so we, we've spent the goodly part of this last hour talking about what is fundraising, what is fundraising for purposes of CSC, what is fundraising for purposes of 808. And I know some, out of, some of you are out there saying, okay, well, this is all lovely and good. It's all about money and collecting donations and participation in the content event. But what about all this other stuff that we have to deal with, these, these collections, you know? Right, yeah, which is uh, very common at the, uh, the Thanksgiving time and over the holidays, you know, collecting food for the food bank or you know, toys for children, things like that. Exactly. So if you could give me the next slide, please. When it comes to the CFC, the CFC states explicitly, explicitly in its definitions, that the 950 regulations do not apply to the collection of gifts in kind, such as clothing, t food, clothing, or toys, um, or to the solicitation of federal employees outside of the federal uh, workplace, as defined by applicable agency head consistent with General Services Administration regulations and any other applicable laws or regulations, okay? So what they're doing a couple of things here. They're saying, okay, if it's collection of goods, CFC doesn't apply. If it's solicitation outside of the federal workplace, CFC doesn't apply. But whatever you do, you have to approve it. You have to make approvals for it. And it has to be consistent with yet another authority that we haven't, we've sort of talked about and danced around, but we haven't really touched on yet. And that is the federal management regulations. Now, these are under the auspices of the General Services Administration, and these govern for what uses federal property may be employed, okay? So this is where it gets complicated. It, so we, ha gets we have not just two layers, we have a third layer now that we have to consider when looking at these kinds of things. Exactly. Now, GSA has made it somewhat easy for us. So if you go to the next slide, if you look at the federal management reg at Title 41, um, this is a provision that talks about uh, what is the policy concerning soliciting, vending, and debt collection. And this basically says, you know, anyone who enters in or on federal property, is they're prohibited from soliciting alms 
or commercial or political donations, vending merchandise of all kinds, displaying or distributing commercial advertising, or collecting private debts, except for. And it's in these exceptions that GSA has given us, you know, a lot of room for, for maneuver. But again, a lot of it's going to push back on you, the agency, to make policies and procedures and to have approval and authorizations for using these exceptions. Um, A deals right with 950. It pulls 950 solicitations right out from underneath the, the provision of this no, no solicitation provision. Um, if you look at um, uh, at B, it says concessions or personal actions posted um, um, notices, I'm sorry, posted by employees on authorized bulletin boards. So we talked about that a little bit earlier. That's expressly pulled out from this provision in, in the FM um, FMR. Can you sl can you pull that slide down just a little bit more to the highlighted piece? Now if you look at the highlighted E, here's where our collections piece comes into play because GSA has has accepted this out from underneath that solicitation prohibition too. It says collection of non-monetary items that are sponsored or approved by the occupant agencies. So this says this provides explicitly agencies the authority to approve these kinds of activities. Exactly. So if you're going to have collections in your space, um, what it would allow for is for you, the agency, to make determinations about where, whether and where you would allow these collections to take place. Um, so the next uh, slide down, this is just kind of a general sensibility about what kind of collections would fall within the ambit of this. Okay. And these are the things we're all really familiar with, you know, uh, canned foods for local food bank, clothing drives uh, at any time of the year, book drives, we see that a lot of times for the, for the benefit of local schools, um, holiday-related toy and gift collections, we see a lot of that at the holiday time. And again, the agency has to determine that this is an appropriate use of its space. Exactly, exactly. Um, so what we, what, if you go to the next slide, please, Patrick, um, it seems to me that they're really, again, you have to, you have to approach these things from, from, with like two different variables here. One is, is this going to be an official collection? Okay? So then it becomes a matter of it's subject to agency authorization and any policies and procedures by the agency and whether or not the agency has the authority to do this would be a, an official collection um, that, uh, that the agency would agree to conduct as sort of part of its regular official you know, government actions. And OGE and has absolutely no authority to tell an agency you know, what you can or can't do in the way of an official collection. Event. And I think that's an important thing to remember as, as a general matter. Uh, the, our regulations primarily deal with the conduct of employees, right? They're the standard of conduct for employees of the executive branch. Mm -hmm. um, generally speaking, they don't constrain too much the prerogative of agencies right. to make decisions, management decisions on their own. And I think in, in, in many cases when agencies want to do something that looks like something that is prohibited for individuals to do in their personal capacities or outside of work, they look to the standards to provide guidance about their agency prerogative, and I think uh, often you find that wanting. Mm -hmm. so we, we, we take measures to, uh, for example, we were talking today about official speeches, mm -hmm. to preserve the prerogative of agencies to make decisions about their own management and operations. Now, I think that whether or not an agency does it or doesn't do it, I think this entirely the agency's prerogative, but I think that there are some considerations, and I think the standards of conduct can inform the way these things are conducted to make sure that they're done in a way that does not, you know, give an appearance of coercion. Right. Um, and a lot of the factors there are, you know, making sure that, you know, like who gets to decide what the charity is for, right. the, for, the, for the particular year. Um, and with that, you want to make sure that whoever is the decider in that does doesn't have any personal affiliations with that organization because then we we are getting back into the standards of Th conduct. Then we could have you know we could have a potential appearance concern under subpart E or even a conflict of interest there. Absolutely, depending upon the nature, the relationship of the individual making the decision and the organization that ultimately is going to benefit from from that decision. I, I think it, you know these are challenging things to navigate, but it's important to consider these two categories. You know, are we talking about proposed agency activity, and then we could look to the standards to in, inform. Uh, whereas with individual conduct, the standards are likely to be dispositive. Exactly. And, and we're going to move on to that in a minute. So, so yeah, you'd have to determine first, uh, the threshold question is, is this going to be an official collection? And if so, do we have you know, all of the authorities and all of the approvals and everything in place to do it? And are we going to do it in a way that doesn't bring any kind of disrepute to, to, the, to the sort of like the, the charitable nature of the event in and of itself and make sure that employees don't feel coerced into participating in the event? Next slide, please. 
So then if, if, if it's not going to be an official collection, then the question becomes, well, what about if an individual employee or a couple of employees come and they want to do it as sort of a, a personal collection? Okay. Um, and this is going to be subject to the standards of conduct and, again, any agency policies and procedures because presumably if they're going to do it, they're going to want to do it somewhere on federal property. And if they're going to be doing it on federal property, then you're going to have to have those approvals in place for the, you know, the, the spaces that aren't the federal workplace, right. you know, and make sure that you're allowing people to use that in a way that's consistent with your own policies and procedures. Um, 808 isn't going to apply because it's not fundraising. Okay? Right, because the in-kind donations are, aren't covered. They're simply outside of the scope. They're outside of the definition of fundraising for, for the fundraising provisions in, in 808. So what you're looking at then are our other authorities, misuse of position, making sure there's no misuse of time, misuse of government property, misuse of um, other um, employees' time. Um, no solicitation of prohibited sources. So there you're looking at the gifts from outside sources provision, which that's just an out and out flat, no how, no way, no soliciting prohibited sources. What makes, makes perfect sense, I think. And then you have to look to your gifts between employees rules, which are going to cover both Soliciting or accepting from employ employees making less pay, and um, if it's a gift to an official superior, um, you would be able to possibly avail yourself um, of the voluntary contribution, um, uh, the voluntary con in kind contribution um, provisions that are in within the standard. So you would really have to be looking at, you know, making sure that if anybody wanted to contribute, they were only contributing in kind. And if they were going to contribute, that it was they were free to contribute or not at all. Okay, that makes sense. And then we finally have uh, the no misuse of position, right? So exactly. Yeah. And so if I, if my counting is correct, these are authorities four, five, and six that we may have to consider when looking at a potential fundraising question. Exactly. So I mean, so that's why these can start getting really kind of hairy. And I think you really need to be considering even over and above the standards of conduct, I mean, the disruption to the workplace. And how are you going to be making discretionary decisions about which employees get to do it? And if some employees get to do it, then any employee who comes to you is going to be able to do this. And then how much of the agency's time, resources, and whatever is going to be put into allowing personal collections you know, in the workplace. And we do see that there, there's risk for, you know, actual misconduct for violations of the standards here mm -hmm. if these things aren't done properly. So when we're doing any of this, even if we can organize it in such a way that it doesn't, you know, immediately pose a problem, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's still a, a, a difficult area to, to navigate. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go down to the, the last couple of slides because we're almost out of time here. Um, and I know one of the final questions that people get, and it's yet another distinguishable event distinguishable from what we even just discussed a minute ago, and that's when you have solicitations and collections that are on behalf of federal employees or for their families. So the distinction here is now we're not talking about a, a solicitation or a collection of goods for a charitable organization. We're talking about a solicitation for either money or goods for federal employees or their families. And typically this is going to come up in the context of um, personal emergencies, natural disasters, um, things like that. Yes. Um, and, and I think that folks are, are concerned about the, the manner in which they could be able to make those kind of solicitations. If you could pull up the next slide. Um, solicitations and collections on behalf of federal employees, um, it's not, or collections at least, collections of goods on behalf of federal employees is not going to be fundraising uh, for purposes of the CFC. Um, and it's not going to be for purposes of 808. Actually, it's, it, you know, either solicitation or collection is not going to be fundraising for CFC purposes or 808 because you're the beneficiary is a federal employee. It's not a, it's a, not a charity. It's not a charity, yes. Okay. So we don't have to worry about either of those authorities. So again, we're going back to your gifts between employees provisions, okay? So um, th here, again, it doesn't matter whether it's employees within your own organization or it's employees who are across the United States. Government employees are government employees and hold status as government employees. So the government employee, gifts between employee rules are going to apply even if you are collecting or soliciting for employees who are out in Nebraska. Right. or wherever they are. Because that's what happens. So we have a natural disaster. It affects uh, federal employees elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And we want to do something. We want to help. But those gifts between employees regulations apply regardless of whether we work in the same office. Exactly. Now, if you have a situation where there is a concern
concerned about it would, it would involve a gift to an employee where they would be deemed to be receiving something from someone who made less money or it was going to be deemed to be potentially a gift to an official superior then you can use the special and frequent occasion exceptions okay okay that will apply I know some folks have some questions about that but even though these types of events may not be expressly articulated in that exception that exception can be used for natural disasters fires and other personal emergencies yeah they're hopefully infrequent yes uh, those and are special not, and they're infrequent. not special in the fun way but you know they they're they're distinct from uh habitual events or uh, uh, events that happen periodically. Exactly. So you could use this exception um, in those circumstances. Uh, one thing I would dissuade you from allowing employees to do is collection of monies. Um, I think that can be problematic, even though that might be the more desirable thing or what they think the more desirable thing for folks is. Um, because even, even under the CFC, the CFC has a special authority for special solicitations, which allows agencies outside of the CFC, whenever there's a natural disaster or something like that, to do a special collection for, for charitable organizations. And even in the CFC, the CFC says, you know, it's not a good idea for the agency to be in the business of collecting monies to be contributing to anybody. And if you're going to do that, you really should allow the organization itself to collect or solicit or whatever those contributions and keep the federal government and the federal employees out of it. I think a similar sensibility is here, that the, the more you can you know, keep, you know, keep your own employees out of the uncomfortable position of collecting monies and being responsible for and accountable for the disbursement of those monies, probably the better here. Um, but just as a final word, again, gifts from outside sources, those provisions are going to apply. They're going to hamper any ability to collect money or goods on behalf of a federal employee because, number one, you can't solicit prohibited sources, so they couldn't be included on any kind of a solicitation for assistance. And particularly if you're trying to collect, there are, well, there just isn't, an, uh, there isn't a special and frequent exception under the That's outside world right. that would apply, and you can't accept gifts of cash. Right. So you would really be kind of like, I think, hampered in your ability to accept anything, even if a prohibited source offered it. Okay. Um, we're just about out of time. We are just about out of time. And um, we're out of slides as well. So, and we're out of so slides that's, as well. That's very handy. Um, so I think in, in summary, I just I would take you to, I would ask you to take a really good look at the document that I gave you because everything we discussed today we laid out in very logical detail in this document. It's a really nice navigational tool. It talks about CFC and gambling and other you know things that I was not going to discuss today. Um, it talks about each of these different kinds of collections, what's fundraising, what isn't. And I think it will help you the next time you're faced with some sort of fundraising challenge to be able to navigate the waters of all of these different authorities and make sure you're covering all your, your bases. And I think when we're looking at anything this complicated, that having a guide to tell us where to look when and make sure that we consider everything is really important. Because this, like many other places where we provide advice, completeness is really the watchword. It's exactly. often the case that you forget to consider an authority or, you know, you don't see how it fits together. And having this kind of advice is, is very, very helpful. Yeah, I think it gives you not only a place to begin, but it does give you a, 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 where, a place to end up. Um, and that's usually a real relief. Um, and you don't have to reinvent the wheel yourself. Yeah, it's sort of a, a roadmap to, to advising in these kinds of situations. Precisely. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Cheryl. I think Thanks, this has Patrick. been really, really helpful. And I hope you uh, who are listening at your desks find this to be helpful as well. I also hope that you will join us next Thursday for the Advanced Practitioner Series. We'll be discussing recent changes to the Ethics Agreement Guide, so if you're involved in drafting ethics agreements, uh, you'll want to check that out, and also our latest legal advisory on pooled investment vehicles. Ooh, that's exciting. Yeah, so we, we look forward to seeing you next Thursday and at future uh, Fundamentals and Advanced Practitioners events. Uh, again, thanks, Cheryl. Thank you, Patrick. And thank all of you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you for joining. This concludes the conference call. All parties may disconnect at this time.